Well, good afternoon to everyone, or I guess it's morning, to get my time here. That was certainly a beautiful song, and I know we all appreciated it. One thing I wanted to mention before starting the sermon is, to again, to ask all of you to pray for the peace and the safety that we have here at the feast. We did have a minor accident involving three cars this morning, so let's please be careful in our driving, and also that God's Spirit and peace will be here among us. I think most of us realize, although we may not have thought of it from this point of view, that there is a higher level of existence than you and I are used to. There's a higher level of existence and living. And you and I are beginning to live that way of life. The world has not yet recognized it, but God has begun to reveal it to us. And we're beginning to live that way. It's hard for us, I think, as humans, I know it is for me, to really visualize what God is like and what the kingdom of God is like and what God's life, how he lives, is like because we don't see God. We know that God is the Spirit and we're still flesh. And so it is difficult for us to visualize the spirit world. But there is another realm out there, another whole, let's say, existence that really is the real world. You and I live in this physical world, but this physical world isn't permanent like God is. God is a spirit, and God is permanent, and his way of life, his existence, is going to go on forever. Let me give you, perhaps it's a crude analogy, but maybe it will illustrate what we're talking about here. What if you went to a primitive society, let's say, such as in Borneo or some of these areas where even in the modern 20th century we have discovered headhunting society. We've discovered people who live in mud huts or under trees, very primitive. What, you know, scientists might call, let's say, Stone Age type of conditions. And what if you took an individual like that who had never seen an automobile, had never heard of a radio, a TV, any of the modern conveniences of society as we know them, you take that individual, pluck him down in the middle of a jet, transport him over to New York City, run him out at Kennedy Airport, what do you think would happen? Well, you would have culture shock, obviously. This individual would look around and probably run, try to hide somewhere in a culvert because of all of the fantastic modern conveniences, inventions, things that we take for granted, but would be absolutely amazing to him. To see an airplane, to see cars, to see computers, to see everything that we sort of take for granted. Now, maybe it's a crude analogy, but I think the comparison is true, that when you come to understand how God lives, how he exists, the society that he functions in, and how he conducts himself, that it's on a much superior and higher level than what we are used to, as we have known about. And God is in the process of revealing that way to us. Let's turn in our Bible to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8, where we get an example here of how much greater God's way is than our way. Notice here, beginning in verse 8, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. And he's talking here about the general way that man lives, contrary to God, cut off from God. And he says in verse 9, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So how high are the heavens above the earth? Well, they're light years away as far as distance is concerned. And God's way of life, the way that God lives, his existence as a spirit being, is so much superior to the way humans live that there's no comparison. If I could, again, use an analogy, if you were to take a little child, maybe two or three years old, who really doesn't understand too much and say, which would you rather have, this big double scoop, 
chocolate ice cream cone where the ice cream is just slithering down the sides and melting and you, you can just almost taste it? Or would you rather have a Cadillac? Well, most kids say, what's a Cadillac? Give me the ice cream cone. So that's what I want, is the ice cream cone. Well, that's sort of the way society is when it comes to God's kingdom. God's kingdom is the Cadillac of the way to live. And most people, and all of us before, have been settling for ice cream without realizing what God has in store for us, the way God wants us to live. Mr. Meredith mentioned yesterday that our next step is going to be the kingdom of God, that there is a new dimension that you and I are going to step into. The one day you and I will step from the human existence to the divine existence, we will become a spirit of God. And today we're going to try to find out what will it be like to be a spirit being in the family of God. How will we live? How will we react? What will we be doing as members of that kingdom? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, notice here again what Paul very plainly states about the situation and, and part of the reason why I think a lot of times we lack clear vision about the plan that God is working out here below. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. Paul writes here, I has not seen, nor ear heard, and neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. And so you find that the average person on the street has no concept, no thought, about what God has prepared for man. The best man's been able to come up with is that we're going to go to heaven, float around on a, a cloud, and pluck on harps. I like occasionally harp music, but at 24 hours a day on a cloud, I don't think I would really enjoy it for all eternity. But this is what man has in mind. Supposedly, we will be like a little puppy dog, viewing God's face in a beatific vision of some sort, and that's what we will be doing for all eternity. It has not yet dawned on man what God is going to do for us, what God is going to do with the human race. Now, it says here what God has prepared for them. Do we realize that for 6,000 years, probably much longer than that, but at least for the last 6,000 years, God's been working, and he has been preparing a kingdom for us. There are things that God, projects that God has been working on, that you and I are going to participate in. It doesn't say exactly what they are here, but let's notice in verse 10. Verse 10 says, God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So God, through his Spirit, has begun to reveal to us his plan, his purpose, what he has in store for us as human beings. But... Let's notice in 1 Corinthians 13, there's a, let's say, clinker in this. Even though God has begun to reveal to us, we don't totally comprehend yet what it's going to be like to be God. If you could talk to a newborn baby before it was born and say, Baby, you know what it's going to be like once you're born? That baby really doesn't have the consciousness to understand what it would be like to be born into the world. Well, I think you and I are in much of the same position. God has begun to reveal to us what his kingdom is going to be like. And yet, as verse 9 says in 1 Corinthians 13, we know in part and we prophesy in part. Even our preaching and our knowing and our understanding is in part. It's not full. We don't totally comprehend like we would like to and like we will one day. In verse 10, we read that when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And then Paul says in verse 12, For now, that's talking about the present time, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. 
Right now, we don't fully comprehend. And God has not totally revealed to us, because I don't think our minds would be able to phantom completely what God has prepared for us. As it says here, God has allowed us to see, but we see through a glass darkly. But then, in the future, we will see face to face. We will no longer be able to just talk about being a spirit being. One day, you and I, in the resurrection, will look eyeball to eyeball with Jesus Christ, with angels, with cherubs and seraphim, and we'll be able to say, Oh, that's what a cherub looks like. That's what those wheels were that were described in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. Now I understand. You see, then we'll be able to see face to face. We don't now. And then it goes on to say, Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And so there is going to come a time when we will comprehend fully and completely once we're in God's kingdom. Now what God does for us today, brethren, God gives us enough information, enough of a glimpse, sort of like the carrot in front of the horse, to tantalize us, to inspire us, to motivate us, to drive us, in a sense to propel us forward so that we will continue to strive for his kingdom, because God wants every one of us in his kingdom. Let's turn back to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 35. And let's begin to see what it is that God has in store for us as spirit beings. I think we all realize that God is preparing a world for the physical human beings, a wonderful world tomorrow that they're going to reside in, and the earth is going to blossom like the rose at that time, like the Garden of Eden. But what will it be like for us as spirit beings at that time? But let's notice in verse 35, we begin to get a glimpse of what that kingdom is going to be like. Breaking into the middle of the thought here, says, women received their dead raised to life again. Says, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Now, why do we find that all of these saints of God were willing to go through the trials, the problems, the martyrdom that they did? The last part of verse 35 tells us that they might obtain a better resurrection that they might be in other words in the first resurrection which is going to be a better resurrection and it's going to be better because you and i are going to qualify for greater positions higher responsibilities than those who come up later on in the second resurrection we have more to overcome today than people are going to have in the millennium Today, you have Satan to overcome, you have this world, and you have your own nature to overcome. And our biggest battle, as you know, is between the two ears, up here in the mind. That's where we have to fight our big battle. But there's going to come a time in the world tomorrow when Satan will be bound, when the whole world will be functioning according to God's law, and when the Sabbath comes, everything closes down. There will be no smoking, there will be none of God's laws blatantly being transgressed as they are today. And so those people are not going to have the same type of temptations and problems that we have. And because it is perhaps a little harder, a little more difficult, a harder struggle, the rewards are going to be commensurate with that. Just as God called Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and called David to be over all of Israel, and he called the twelve apostles to each one of them to be a king over the twelve tribes, so has God called you and me to specific jobs and offices. We are going to have leading jobs, not as high as David or the apostles, but we are going to have leading jobs in the family of God forever. We are going to be those leaders. If you want to phrase it another way, you and I are going to be in on the foundation of the kingdom of God. Have you ever dreamed about being on the ground floor of a corporation, an organization, and having the opportunity to, let's say, see it grow from the very beginning? I think there are probably a number of men here who have thought, well, if I could only invent this gizmo, if I could have thought of this new idea or this new invention, and I could market it, well, look how rich I could be. As an example, Henry Ford, and we're all familiar with Henry Ford, in 1903, he started the Ford Motor Company. 
He had a handful of men who backed him with a few thousand dollars. By 1919, Henry Ford bought out, purchased all of the stocks on these minority stockholders in his company. And in just a few short years, about 16 years, he had to pay them $75 million to buy out their stocks. From 1903 to 1919, that company had grown that large. And so he bought them out and became you know, the, the total owner of the company at that time. Now, here were men who invested a few thousand dollars and ended up with multiple millions of dollars. And in the same way, you and I today are having to give up some. We're having to grow. We have to overcome. We have to apply ourselves. But we are getting in on the ground floor. And we are going to be the ones who will rule this universe. God has called us to get in on the ground floor of the biggest thing that has ever happened in this universe. And that is God's kingdom and ruling that kingdom. And as the family of God grows, and it will grow throughout the millennium, when the second resurrection takes place, there will be billions of people who will be resurrected, have their chance of salvation, and eventually come into God's family. And as that family continues to grow, you and I will always be on the top. We will always be in the upper, let's say, levels of government. God's government can be compared to a triangle or a pyramid, if you want to compare it that way. On the top is God the Father. Under him is Jesus Christ. And then probably come men like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and others that God has called for specific jobs. But you and I are going to be right under those individuals. And as the billions of human beings in the millennium and then in the great white throne judgment come into God's kingdom and the bottom of this pyramid continues to grow and gets larger and larger, our jobs keep going higher and higher. And we continue to have more authority and more rule. And so we will have those top positions guaranteed to us forever. We don't have to worry about some Johnny come lately, so to speak, coming along and yanking our responsibilities away from us. God has called us to those jobs and those responsibilities. Now let's notice in verse 39, verse 39 here of Hebrews 11, here's sort of a summary statement of what's going to happen to all of those who will be in the first resurrection. For these all, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise, God having provided something better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Brethren, there is going to come a time when you and I will be made perfect. You're not perfect right now. None of us are. We're flawed. We're human. But there is going to come a time when we will be perfect. The Greek word here is not the normal word that just means mature. It means completed. It means finished. Accomplished, like accomplishing a goal, sort of running a race. There is going to come a time when you and I will have accomplished the purpose for human life, and that is to be a member of the family of God. Now, I know it's hard for us to visualize today being perfect, but there is going to come a time when we will be perfect, and that means you won't sin. Think of what your chief thought is right now. I have a list here, but it's too big to, to show you mine, so we'll disregard that. You can talk to my wife. Uh, she's up on those things. We all are flawed today. We all have weaknesses. And we realize that we have to overcome to be in God's kingdom, and yet we will not be perfect when the resurrection takes place. But once the resurrection does take place, you know, this is something I think we've all wondered about. How can we be perfect? Here we're not perfect, and then the resurrection takes place, and then all at once we are perfect. How does that happen? Well, it happens because in this life, you develop the right attitude, the right approach. You have the mind of God. Your character is right. You see, what we are doing now is developing the right character, the right approach to life. And then when the resurrection takes place, God puts that godly character into a spirit body, and you are perfect at that point. Now, part of our problem is that we're human, 
And with the pulls of the flesh and the influence that Satan can have on us and the influence he can have on our physical mind, then we are subject to those temptations. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, it does describe our existence at that time. And this is the state that all gods exist in. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. We read here that whosoever is born of God, and that will be us if we participate in that resurrection, we will be born twice. We will be born the second time into the family of God. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. The Bible says, for his seed, that's God's seed, the Spirit of God remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. You see, that is the type of attitude we must develop now. We must have the attitude that we don't want to sin, that we hate sin, we despise it, and yet we do sin because of weaknesses and thoughts and problems, and yet we can, with God's help, overcome. So God promises there's going to come a time when we will be perfect and we will no longer sin, and that's that's a time to look forward to. Now let's notice in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel, the twelfth chapter, describes what will happen to us the day that we're born into the very family of God. Daniel, chapter 12, and verse 1. This is describing the events that transpire take place at the end time. We read that at that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince which stands for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And then verse 2 says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Those who have died and gone on before will awake, will come back to life. It says, Some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, if we are alive at that time, we will be changed, and we will at that moment possess everlasting life. Now, again, my mind cannot really phantom that. Living forever, having life. God has self-contained life. He is life. He has that power, that energy that radiates out from him. And you and I will be like that at that moment. And then verse 3 says, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. We are those who God has called to be wise now. And if we continue on in that wisdom, obeying God, we will shine like the stars in the heavens. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. You and I at that time will have a glorified body. We will be spirits. Let's notice in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 26. Ezekiel 126 describes a little bit. Here's one of those glimpses into the kingdom of God. Sort of like looking through the, the glass darkly to be able to perceive what it will be like to be a spirit being. Because we have here Ezekiel. And in vision, God revealed to Ezekiel what it would be like to see spirit beings in their glorified state. So let's notice what you and I will look like as a glorified being. This is going to be your new body. Look at your old body right now. You know, I have these hard age spots on my hands. Uh, you know, you have your hair falling out. You have pimples. You have blemishes. You look at your flesh. And we're a physical human being. We look at our body. Some of us, again, we don't like the look of our bodies, but there they are. Now, let's notice what your new body is going to look like. This is you in the future. In verse 26, Ezekiel said, Above the firmament, or above the platform that he saw here, it was over their heads, was the likeness of a throne. As the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of a throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. He looked like a man, the appearance of a man, the bodily shape of a man. And verse 27, I saw as the color of amber. This is sort of describing a bronze type of color. 
which is a dark orange-yellow type of color. As the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire. Now, it's hard for us to conceive a spirit being, but if you can think of, you know, a million atomic bombs, that type of power, compacted into a body, looking like fire, looking like the sun in the shape of a human body, let's say, that's what God looks like as a spirit being. Energy and power radiating out from him, glory. It says, as the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. And as the appearance of the bowl that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. This is what the glory of God looks like. Now, you and I may not have, to the same degree, the glory that God has, but we will be glorified. We will shine. We will radiate. And I think to different degrees, according to how we overcome now. Mr. Armstrong mentioned yesterday in the sermon that there are three levels of spirit. One level is the spirit in man. The second level is angelic. And above all spirits is God's spirit. God is holy. He is a spirit. And his spirit, the Holy Spirit, God gives to us today. And through that spirit, through that power, we will be transformed to become like God is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 39, again, I wish Paul had written a few more chapters dealing with this subject. There are several things that you find Paul wrote about, and he said, well, I'll I'll mention more to you later. I wish he had mentioned more to us now, you know, so that we would have it. Because he was a man who walked and talked with God, much like David did in the Old Testament. And so, therefore, God revealed things to him. Let's notice here in verse 39. It says, All flesh is not the same flesh, and there's one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of beast, of fish, another of birds. We all understand that, different types of fleshes. There are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. And there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. Some are bigger, some radiate more energy and more power from them. He goes right on in verse 42, With this thought in mind, saying, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. And that describes all of us. We are corruptible. When you get up with halitosis and bad breath, you know how corruptible you are. We are corruptible human beings. So it is sown in corruption, the human body. It is raised in incorruption. We will one day be incorruptible. That means your body will no longer corrupt. It will no longer decay. Your hair won't be falling out. You won't have to worry about dentist bills and tooth decay, bad breath, sickness, disease, measles, whatever it might be. Those things will have disappeared into the past. Then verse 43 says, It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. So our bodies are going to be raised in glory. And it seems that as we overcome in this life that we will be given either more or lesser honor depending on how we do now, our growth and our development. You find that it is sown in weakness. This body is very weak, very pitiful. The Bible says it is raised in power. Now how much power will we have? We will have the power of a God being. And God, we find, upholds the whole universe by his power. We will have the ability to create. We will have powers that God has. There's not a one of us here who at one time or another perhaps have had a a relative who's died, or we've seen on pictures, we say on TV, suffering in some nations where people are starving, and we haven't been touched, and we've wanted to sort of reach out and help those people to heal a person who's sick, raise somebody from the dead to feed the hungry and the needy, and yet we're powerless to do that. But when you step over into this new dimension, 
and you become God, and you exist on the level of God, and you become a spirit being, God is going to share his existence and his power with you. And we will have the power at that time to radically change this world and make it a better place for people to live in. So let's notice going on in verse 44. We read that it's thrown a natural body. It has raised a spiritual body. And you and I are going to, again, be spirit, not physical. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. Verse 53 well, let's back up to verse 52. It says, In a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, that tells you when we're going to be born into God's family, at the last trump, the seventh trumpet, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So we are going to have immortality at that time. There will be no more worries about death, about pensions, about money accounts, about all of the things that we human beings worry about, Social Security, old age, death, all of that will be eliminated. And you and I are going to be immortal. We will have everlasting life. And think what that means. Every one of us here at this feast, I'm sure, would love to meet everybody else, but it's humanly impossible. If you stood outside here and shook hands and you know, just talked a couple of minutes with everybody in here, it would take days and days and days to do that. Now think about billions of gods in the family of God. And you would think, well, how in the world would I ever get around to meeting all those people? You've got all eternity. You will eventually become acquainted with all of those people. And you won't have to worry about remembering their names. That's a problem, isn't it? That's a problem we all face. I'm going to be thankful when God gives me a mind, a spirit mind, that has the breadth and the depth and the ability that God does. The only thing that I can even begin to think of that would compare to it is the computer. We all know how powerful computers are, and they can spit information out in milliseconds. Think of what God can do. Remember we read in Isaiah 55 that God says His thoughts and His ways are so far superior to man and what man has done that it's as high as the heavens are above the earth. And I think that includes computers also. And that God's way, God's ability, are so far superior to that. God says he calls all of the stars by name. And there are billions of them out there. Now, if God can do that, think of the depth of mind that you and I will have. And then we meet somebody, we won't go, what's your name, what's your name? We, we won't have to get. We will know. And we will have all eternity to spend with our loved ones. I think this is something that we in God's church understand and people in the world do not comprehend, that if you have a mate or a child or a loved one or relative who dies, that person is not permanently dead. They're only dead for a while. Because God promises to resurrect every human being and give them a chance of salvation if they've not had a chance yet. And you and I will have the opportunity to live forever if our children, our relatives, make it into God's kingdom, that we will know them and we will be able to see them and talk with them forever. And that's going to be a blessing that we will have at that time. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16 gives us a, another description of what it's going to be like at that time. Here again, it describes what a spirit being is like. It describes Jesus Christ. Revelation 1, verse 16 says, He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That's the word of God. And his countenance was as the sun that shines in his strength. So just like the sun radiating all of that power and energy out, that's what a spirit being looks like as far as the countenance. You know, a person who is sharp, alert, you can see that there's a certain spirit and sparkle in the eye. Now, when we're like the sun, there's going to be a sparkle there, all right. We're going to really be a glorified being, and we will radiate at that time. And notice in chapter 3, verse 9, while we're here, let's take a look at this. And this is specifically directed to us in the Philadelphia Church of God. Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say that they are Jews, who claim to be Christians. And they're not, but they do lie. 
God says, Behold, I will make them to come and to worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. There's going to come a time when human beings will bow down before you and worship you. Now that, that is just all inspiring. To realize there's going to come a time when we will be worthy of worship and when human beings will worship us because we are God and what God has done through us. Now, let's turn back to the book of Obadiah. And maybe one book you might have trouble finding. Look for the book of Amos, the book of Jonah, and right between the two. Little book of Obadiah. And here in verse 21 of the book of Obadiah, we begin to get a glimpse. We begin to see we can begin to understand a little bit about what it's going to be like to be a God and what God is going to have us to do at that time. In verse 21, we read here that saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord. Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth as King of kings and Lord of lords, and you and I are going to be referred to as saviors because we are going to save this world, this sick, degenerate society that we live in. We're going to change it, and we're going to save people from themselves. But there's going to be a problem at the beginning of the millennium that we're going to face. Because, you see, as we go out to try to begin to lead and teach and guide these people into God's way, there are going to be many people who are going to think that perhaps we're an invader from outer space. Or they might think that we might even be a demon. You see, there is a church, the universal church in existence today, that has a number of prophecies concerning the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. And their people are going to be taught that when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, that he is the Antichrist. And they're going to be taught that you and I are demons. And so when the tribulation is over, the day of the Lord is finished, Christ returns to the earth and we go and we begin to try to pull people out of the caves and in the, let's say, the rocks where they've been hiding, out of the basements, wherever they might be, and we're going to say, God's on the earth. Christ is here. Your worries are over. The kingdom of God is here. They're going to run. Many of them will hide. They will not believe it. I could read to you many of these, but let me just read a couple of prophecies to you. This is a Catholic prophecy. Back in 1682, this is taken from a book entitled Prophecy for Today by Edward Connors, and it contains a number of these type of prophecies. It says the Antichrist will be an iconic class. That means he'll be against images. Most of the world will adore him. He will teach that the Christian religion is false. I want you to notice, they say that this is the Antichrist. And you and I know that this is exactly what Christ will do. But many of them will believe that this is the Antichrist. He will teach that the Christian religion is false. Confiscation of Christian property is legal. <coughs> Saturday is to be observed instead of Sunday. Note that. Saturday will be observed instead of Sunday. And he will change the Ten Commandments. Now why? Because in that particular church, the one concerning idolatry is left out. The one concerning covetousness is broken into two parts. So he will come back and teach the Ten Commandments as they were meant to be taught. And he will teach against idolatry. All of his wonders could not be written in a book. They will be more wonderful than the Old and the New Testament. He will read people's minds, raise the dead. That's us. We're going to be raised, you know, those who have died if we die. There will be a resurrection. He will reward his followers and he will punish the rest. Sounds exactly what Jesus Christ will be doing. Another one says the Antichrist will fight a successful battle at Megiddo in Palestine, after which he will thereafter become the Lord of the world. Isn't that what Zechariah 14 verse 9 says? That he will be king over all of the earth? And then one final one. His doctrine will be an apparent contradiction of no religion, yet a new religion. It's going to be totally new from what most people are familiar with. He will teach the worship of devils. 
That's what I read to you in Revelation 3, 9. People will come and worship before our feet. We won't be devils. We will be spirit beings in the family of God. And yet these people will be taught that we are demons. And then it says he will begin by affecting respect for the law of Moses. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ will do when he returns to this earth. So can you imagine when millions of these poor, deceived, deluded individuals who've been taught these prophecies, and if you and I as a spirit being come up to them and say, let's come back to Jerusalem. God is on the earth. This is the way that we should live. And they think that you're a demon. You may get a little resistance from some of them. But I'm sure that with the power of God, with the proper understanding and love, that we will be able to help those people. You see, God has called us to become saviors. And Savior means that we're going to free people from superstition, from ignorance, from false religion, from all of the unhealthy, wretched ways that they've been living. And we're going to teach them God's way. And you know why we will know God's way? Because you're living it right now. We're learning it. And as we learn it, we will be able to teach it to those people. Let's notice in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 again what Daniel says here. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 shows that one of our duties is to take away from this world the false religions. Whatever those false religions might be that have enslaved the masses of humanity down through the last 6,000 years, those false religions will be removed, will be terminated. They will no longer be in existence. Daniel 7, verse 25. This is talking about the great false prophet, the real Antichrist at the end time. For he shall speak great words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and he shall think to change time and laws, and they shall be given into his hands at a time, times, and a half dividing at times. So for three and a half years during the tribulation period, you find here the martyrdom of the saints, the Laodicean church era. But verse 26 says, But the judgment shall sit, and they, who is they? Those of us who are in God's church, the saints, they shall take away his dominion. The dominion of all of these false teachers and religious workers, they will have that taken away from them. Their dominion shall be taken away to consume and to destroy it unto the end. So when I say we will destroy the false religions, that's exactly what the scriptures say. They will be totally eliminated. And verse 27 says, The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. So the dominion of the whole earth, the rule, that's what dominion is talking about, the rule, the government over this earth is going to be given to us. Now let's notice in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. Matthew 25, verse 34 one of the first things that will be said to spirit beings as they're born into the family of God, and God is, well, then in the, in the process, give us that dominion. Because let's realize that we won't have the dominion over the whole earth immediately. It's going to take a little time to spread God's government completely around this earth, because human beings are not going to accept it immediately. But verse 34, notice what it says here about those who enter into the kingdom. Then shall the king say unto those on his right hand, Come you, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I think that shows how long God's been working on it. Mr. Armstrong said yesterday that God's been doing certain things from the foundation of the world. And one of them is that God is preparing a kingdom for us. He is preparing things for us to do. He is preparing things to give to us. Now verse 21, verse 21 of this chapter, the end or the conclusion of the parable of the talents, this is what God will say unto us when we are born into his family. His Lord shall say unto him, well done. And one day Jesus Christ is going to say that to you and to me if we make it into his family. He's going to look us in the eye and maybe hug us. And he's going to say, well done you good and you faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. It means that we will be serving humanity. Too often in this society, because of the wrong 
education that we've received. We think of a ruler as some big high potentate that everybody bows down in front of and that he has that type of authority. We don't think of somebody who comes down and serves and helps. What we need to realize, the greater your reward in God's kingdom, the greater is your opportunity for service. The more people you can serve, the greater you can help. Because if you only rule over one city, you help one city. Serve and help sin. To illustrate what I'm talking about, look at the President of the United States. President Reagan, as the President, is able to do more good, or evil, it can work either way, but let's, we're using the analogy of doing good, helping. He can do more good for more people in this country than any other man because he is the President. And he is the President over the 50 states. So when he enacts or signs a law into law, let's say, then that will affect everyone in the United States. Now, a governor of a state is able to help only one-fiftieth of those people. And so he's a governor over a state. He can help all of the people within his state, but he cannot do as much as the president can because the president's over all of it. And then you come down to a mayor... A mayor is able to help those in your city and serve them. But as you go up and you have more authority, you are able to help more people. Now, Jesus Christ, when he returns to this earth, will be the greatest servant because he will be Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and he will rule over all of the earth. And so when he institutes policies and they are carried out, he will be able to help every human being on the face of the earth. Under him will be Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, David, the twelve apostles, and then finally, brethren, will come up. And I shouldn't say finally. You and I will be able to rule over cities. We may be in charge of radio or TV. We may be in charge of the educational system. You look at all of the things that this work, this era of God's church has been involved with, and to realize that the vast majority of people who have lived and died who will be in the family of God have never lived in an age like today. When David comes up in the kingdom, even though he will be over all of Israel, he doesn't know what a computer is. He doesn't know what electricity is. He does not know what rockets and automobiles are, but we do. And God will use this church era to bridge the gap between this world and the world tomorrow. And our job and our functions are going to be very great. You know, I think sometimes it's difficult for us to imagine what it will be like to rule over cities. Let's turn back to Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 8. Now I want you to notice the principle that's brought out here. It's difficult for us to fathom, well, I'm going to rule over so many cities, or over a million people, or a thousand people. It might be hard for some of us to imagine ruling over two people. But God is going to call us to rule the nation. Here in Ezekiel 38 and verse 8, it talks about a time when Jesus Christ is on the earth. Israel has been brought back out of captivity, and they have been brought back to the promised land. And yet, many Gentile nations have not come under God's government yet. And you'll find in verse 8, it says, After many days you shall be visited in the latter years. You shall come into the land that is brought back with the sword and is gathered out, of, gathered out of many people against the mountains of the nations of Israel, which have been always waste, and it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. And what you find, the principle is, that the millennium will start at Jerusalem. Jesus Christ will come back to Jerusalem, and we will work right under Christ, and I'm sure with the assistance and the help of the angels, and we will begin to learn how to rule right there in Jerusalem. Then the government will spread out over Palestine. And we will take the skills, the abilities that we learn, because remember, we're gods at that time. We tend to think as human beings. But when you're in the God family and you've had a few weeks or a few months working under Christ, and you see how he works, how he operates, his approach, you and I will have the mind to be able to just absorb that like a sponge. And then we will be able to go out and begin to teach the people in Palestine. And then the other nations, one by one, will be brought under God's government. And we will begin to extend God's government over the rest of the world. 
Let me just use another analogy that perhaps might explain it. What if, this is one of those what if, what if you just started as a God being in the family of God, ruling over, over only six families? You know, we'll start small. We'll say six families you're ruling over. And each one of those six families had five children. So let's say, or five members, we'll put it that way. That's 30 people, perhaps, you could rule over. And another generation would be 150. Third generation, you'd have 750. By the fourth generation, you would have around 3,750. You get down to about the sixth generation, and we're talking about 93,000 people. What about uh, 10 or 12, you know, 14 generations into the millennium? You and I at that time, by the time the millennium will end, will be capable of ruling over millions of people. We'll start small. And God knows exactly the capacity that each one of us will have, how much we've overcome, and he won't, he won't put you over a million people to start with if you're not capable. If you can only start over five or ten or a small city of a hundred or two hundred, he'll start you there. But as you progress, as you learn, as you grow, and let's face it, as God, we will grow. We will mature. We'll continue to grow. God learns, and we will continue to learn, and we will, at the end of the millennium, be capable of ruling vast millions of people. And that's what God's called us to do. Now, back in Matthew chapter 25, Matthew the 25th chapter and verse 21, I want you to notice, again, something that's mentioned here, and I've often mused on this or thought about it. Matthew chapter 25, verse 21 again, where Christ will say, Well done, now good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a few things, I will make you rule over many things. Enter you into the joys of your Lord. Now, have you ever stopped to think about what is he talking about, the joys of the Lord or the joys of God? What kind of joys and pleasures will we observe or be able to participate in as God? Well, to get a clue to that, turn to Psalm 16 and verse 11. A scripture probably many of us have never really focused on. But chapter 16 and verse 11 of the book of Psalms describes what it's going to be like to be in the family of God. It's talking about how Christ would not be allowed to see corruption in verse 10. And verse 11 says, You will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. In God's presence, in God's kingdom, in God's family, there is total, complete joy. And at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You see, where, where do people get this idea to be born into the family of God is going to be dull and uninteresting and boring. You and I will have joy running over. One of the fruits of God's Spirit is joy, and we're just beginning to learn today, with God's help, how to be joyful. Think about a time when you will be totally joyful, and when you, there will be pleasures forevermore. It will be fun to be God. It will be a joy. We will always, as spirit beings, have joy and hope instead of the suffering, the pain, the problems, the heartaches, the emotional distress that people suffer today. We won't have that problem at that time. We will be joyful. Think of the joy. You know, this is something that I think we need to meditate on. We as human beings need to reflect and try to meditate and visualize what will it be like to be in God's family. Think of the joy of seeing human beings, from your perspective as a God being, being begotten by God's Spirit. I don't know exactly how that takes place, but I know that we know God's Spirit is put in the mind. To be able to see that actually take place. To see a human being also, after a generation into the millennium, be changed from a human being into the God family. To be able to observe that. To have the joy of answering people's prayers. Again, haven't you ever wanted to be able to just answer somebody's prayer, be able to do something for them? As spirit beings, I'm sure that God will use us in some of these areas. We will also have the joy of dealing with our own offspring. If God blesses us to allow our families to live on over into the world tomorrow, 
we will be able to deal with them. Psalm 45, turn over to chapter 45, verse 13. One of these exciting chapters of the Bible that describes some of the events in the kingdom of God and the millennium. Here we find, beginning in verse 13, the church, the bride, described, The king's daughter is all glorious within, her clothing is of wrought gold. And she shall be brought unto the king in raiments of needlework. The virgins, her companions, that follow her, shall be brought unto you. And this is an analogy or picture of the bride coming to Christ. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of your father shall be your children, whom you may make princes in all of the earth. And we will take our children, and they will be princes in the earth. And I will make your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise you forever and ever. So our names will be remembered forever. Now right now I have five sons. And if God blesses us for all five of our sons to live on over into the world tomorrow, what if each one of those sons had only three children? Uh, I'm not telling them how many children to have, but let's say what if they, they only had three children? Well, one generation, there'd be 15 holidays in the world tomorrow. Second generation, there'd be 45. Somewhere down the seventh generation, there'd be 3,645. And it just keeps going. Our names, our children will be there. How much time as a human being are you able to spend with your offspring, with your children? Well, it's been proven in this nation that the average father speaks something like 30 35 seconds to his offspring during the day, each one of them. That's not spending very much time. As a God being, you don't have to sleep. You don't need to rest. You don't have to worry about eating. As a spirit being, you could work 18, 20 hours a day and spend four hours with your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your great-great-great-grandchildren. It could go on and on, dealing with them, helping them. Would it not be a joy from the perspective of a God being to work with your children and bring about their conversion, to help change their mind, maybe help select mates for them, and then eventually see them born into God's kingdom? I've seen four out of my five children born as human beings. What a tremendous privilege it will be to see them born a second time, this time not a flesh, but a spirit, into the very family of God, and to be with them then forever and to have that family you know we won't be families we'll be gods at that time but we'll have that relationship at that time verse 11 again back in well let's turn to for one of time here to psalm 36 psalm chapter 36 verses 8 and 9 here Verse 8 says, They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of your house, and you shall make them drink of the rivers of your pleasure. I think that can apply both physically and spiritually, but we will drink of the pleasures of God's kingdom. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light shall we see light. In God's kingdom, brethren, there are going to be pleasures. You see, one of the problems today with humanity is that people are searching for pleasure. There's something missing. And so they turn to drugs, they turn to alcoholism, they turn to TV. They're looking for something that will fill up that void. In God's kingdom, there will be pleasure, there will be joy. You see, God beings can eat. We don't need to eat to sustain our lives, but you find that Christ, after he was resurrected, ate. You find that even God can drink. God laughs. God can go to concerts. God works. God learns, and as a spirit being, you and I will exist on that level. God is taking society, and he's going to elevate it to a God level, to a greater height. And in God's family, we will sit down, not to just a hundred voice choir and twelve pieces in a brass ensemble, but to maybe millions of angels or spirit beings. How many of you have ever thought, if you have a musical background, that God may use you in the musical department in the world tomorrow? and that you may be over a feast site helping arrange the music at that time. What we do now is preparing us for our jobs at that time. And there are going to be many pleasures. We will have concerts. We will work. 
and we will experience life to the full without any of the kickbacks. Psalm chapter 149 describes this in more detail. Psalm chapter 149 and verse 5. The picture of the way it's going to be in God's kingdom. We read here, let the saints be joyful in glory. I already described to you what it's going to be like to be a God and be glorified. So it says, be joyful in glory. We will have joy and pleasure at that time. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Now, spirit beings don't need to sleep, but we will have a couch to sit on. We'll have an office. We'll have a place to hang our hat, so to speak. And we'll have a place that we will function from. And God is going to give us position, and we will have rule. In verse 8, we find a part of our job, especially at the very beginning of the millennium, is to bind kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor has all of his saints. You see, we will dispose not only of the false religions of this world, but of the despots, the wrong rulers. We'll put down the governments of this rule, world and set up God's kingdom. Now, in chapter 145 of the book of Psalms, we find that you and I, as spirit beings, will be able to give people the inside dope on what it's like to be in the family of God, what Jesus Christ is like. You see, in the millennium, people will say, what is Christ really like? I've had people ask me, what is Mr. Armstrong really like? Because they haven't known Mr. Armstrong, and I have not had the opportunity to know him as well as Mr. Meredith or some of the older ministers, but I did go to Ambassador College in 1959, and Mr. Armstrong at that time took many of the classes, forms, assemblies, was on the campus all of the time, and we got to know him in a special way that, again, many of the students even today do not. And so when people ask me about Mr. Armstrong or they have an opinion that is false, I can tell them. I can tell them what type of a, a man that he really is. Notice here in verse 10 what it says here about God's kingdom. All of your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you, and they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. You see, the human beings, our children in the world tomorrow, won't have the problem, at least to start with, that you and I have catching the vision of the kingdom. We will be spirit beings. We will be able to appear and disappear. We will be able to sit down and talk to them personally and tell them what the kingdom of God is like. As it says here, we will speak of the glory of the kingdom, and we will talk of his power. We will tell them what God is like and what the power of the spirit being is like. And to make known to the sons of man his his mighty act and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. We will describe that. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. We will be able to convey to that generation what it will be like to be a spirit being. You see, the best recruiters we have right now for Ambassador College are Ambassador College students because they're there. They experience it. And so a lot of times, young people here in the local church areas talk to students, and they're inspired by these Ambassador College students. And we will be able to inspire the whole world because we will be God, and we will be able to tell them. And if we see somebody growing lazy and lax, we'll be able to motivate them, stir them up, inspire them in that direction. Isaiah 30, we're familiar with, verse 20, 21, says, There's coming a time when your teachers will no longer be hidden from you, and as spirit beings... We will have the ability to materialize before humans and to talk to them and to educate them. And as each generation goes along in the world tomorrow, they will learn, and each generation will build on the knowledge of the preceding generation. I think we will be dumbfounded at the understanding and comprehension 500 years into the millennium that people will have of the scriptures and the Bible, the additional information that they will know, and likewise that we will know because we will continue to grow as spirit beings. In Revelation chapter 21, Revelation the 21st chapter, we have a picture here of what it's going to be like in the God family forever. You might say this is a picture of the God family as it will be forever, and the way we will exist. 
Verse 21 is talking about the time of the new heavens and the new earth. This is the time when all human beings have had their chance of salvation. You've either been born into the family of God or you cease to exist in the lake of fire. And verse 1, it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride. And I want you to notice that the New Jerusalem is compared to the bride of Christ. And the bride is compared to the New Jerusalem. She is prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That means properly attired and dressed. And this is one thing that God has been doing. God is preparing a city, a habitation, a place for the bride to dwell, for us to dwell in. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. God the Father himself will come down to this earth. This will be his headquarters. He will rule the universe from here, with Jesus Christ assisting him. And verse 4 says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. We will all be spirit beings, no more capable of death. Neither will there be sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for all of the former things are passed away. Former things, as we know them as human beings, have ceased, and we are now spirit beings. And verse 7 says, He that overcomes shall inherit all things. Or as the margin says, all these things. You and I will eventually inherit the universe. Everything that our Father owns. And it says, I will be his God and he shall be my son. And you find that God has prepared a city for us. Verse 16 says it's a city that's 1,500 miles square. And it's a beautiful city. And apparently this city is where the bride will dwell at that time. Notice verse 24. Verse 24 says, The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. What you find, the New Jerusalem, from what we can understand, apparently is going to be the habitation of God the Father, Christ, and the Bride. There will be others who will be saved, who will be born into the family of God, other nations, as verse 24 says. And they'll walk in the light of that city of God, but they apparently will live in other cities and dwell in other places. And you and I, brethren, will dwell with God and with his Son forever. We will be at the headquarters. We will have the opportunity of being on that headquarters team and helping to rule the, the universe. And God will use us in helping to rule over the rest of the family of God forever. As I mentioned to start with, you and I are being given the chance of being on, in on the foundation of the greatest thing on the face of the earth, the kingdom of God. God is going to give us authority in the future over his creation. You and I are the first root. We're the first ones called. We will also be in the first resurrection. And we, in all eternity, will be a part of the first or the leading, leading city of the whole universe, the New Jerusalem. And God will use us as his headquarters staff to help him in dealing with the rest of the God family and administering his government throughout this universe. Brethren, this is our calling. This is our destiny. This is what God has called us to. Let's keep that vision in front of us and realize that it is going to be a tremendous, fantastic thing to be a spirit being in the kingdom of God. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.